Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. You know, a lot of music is based upon themes. You get it a lot if you go to the movies and they're playing theme music. I know John Williams of the Boston Pops used to write a lot of theme music. In fact, I think he wrote a lot of the music for Star Wars. But the, in a theme, I should define what that means. In theme music, you have a certain theme and it runs through the entire piece. Now, it's, if it's a symphony, a symphony has three parts and you'll get one group of notes it's like a melody line and every so often that gets repeated now it might get repeated in a different key or the timing might be a little bit different or the notes may be a little different but the basic song is about the same so that that theme runs through the entire music and usually you have a song it's written in three parts you have the melody on the first part and then you have a, a, a a section in the middle uh, that's a little different. Sometimes it's called a bridge, depending upon where you're playing it. And it's like a different song. It's not exactly the same as what you played before. Then you go into the third part of the song, and you play it, and, and the uh, theme of the whole song is repeated again. It's like repeating the first part over again. Here again, not verbatim the same, uh, but maybe some differences, maybe a difference in key, maybe a difference in rhythm, but the basic theme is always there. And so a lot of songs are written that way, and it makes sense to do that, because if you want to write a song that people are going to remember, then you want to write it so there is a theme in it, and they can kind of follow that theme along. And if it's a theme that they really like, they may remember it if they hear it long enough, and it runs through their mind. And you know, people do love songs. They love songs that appeal to them, either in terms of, of the words, because the words mean something to them, or in terms of the melody and the harmony, which means something to them, something that works with their brain, something that activates their brain, so they feel a certain way, or, or they love whatever it is. You know, we do have all kinds of different tastes in music, and what one person likes, another person wouldn't. But I don't want to get into that so much. I want to explore themes today in music. So I got up this morning, and I, I, a song came to me, and uh, I usually don't write music just before I leave for the studio, but I kind of liked what I was hearing in my brain, and that's how I write music. And all of a sudden, it comes to me, and there it is. And so I wrote this down. You're going to notice, I'm going to play it. I'm not going to play it too fast. I'm going to explain what I did. I'm going to kind of dissect it for you and then show you how it could be written in different ways. So I'm going to play this, and the only thing I titled is a song based on a theme. So this is just a simple song, you know, we're not going to be playing Chopin or anything like that, but I like it. It's just a nice little song. So uh, the theme is carried through. Every three or four measures, it repeats itself, but it repeats itself a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper, until finally it comes to a conclusion. So let me play this. It's in the key of G, there's one sharp. It's in the, it's in the time signature of three, four, so it's kind of of like a waltz tempo, so I'll play that. There's a repeat sign in it, but I'll go into all of that when I show you the the uh, uh, thing on the the manuscript on the page. But this is a song. That's the whole thing. And the theme is you have your two eighth notes and two quarter notes, one and two, three, because it's in the, case, it's in the time signature of three fourths. One and two, three, one and two, three, one and two, three, and that kind of goes all the way through the song. Now, I wrote it deliberately and didn't make much changes. The notes are a little different, so you can have a kind of melody following through it, but I, it, the, the timing is the same all the way through, pretty much. So let me go here 
And I'm going to pull this over a little bit because I want to show you this first, and then I'll move it back. Good. Now I can see that. We have a treble clef because most of the recorders are playing in treble clef. It's in the key of G. You have that one sharp, and I have three fourths. That means it's it re written in three fourths time, which is waltz time. Now the top number is how many beats of measure, and the the bottom number is what kind of note it is. So it's three beats of measure and. Four, the, the quarter notes are fourth notes because there are four quarters in a whole, so therefore it's quarter notes. So you have the equivalent of three quarter notes in every measure. So let me, and there's right here a repeat sign. So if I'm to count this, now uh, you can't do it out loud if you're playing, but you can think in your mind, count it in your mind. I know piano players and guitarists and people who have their mouths free when they play will sometimes count aloud when they're first learning a piece. So here we go. One and two, three, one and two, three, one and two, three, one, two, three. That is a dotted half note. How does that get to be three beats? Well, in three, four, or four, four time, a half note is two beats. A dot is half the value of the two beats added to it, which means it's one beat. So you add them together, you get three beats. And then you go back to one and two, three, one and two, three, one and two, three, and now you have a whole note. So why does it get to be a whole note? That whole note is really the same value as that dotted half, because a whole note is always the, uh, the value of what the measure is. And since it's 3, 4 time, it's going to be 3 beats. So I could write a whole note, or I can write a dotted half. It doesn't matter. It means the same thing. Then you go on. 1 and 2, 3, 1 and 2, 3, 1 and 2, 3, and I have the dotted half note again. And I have this line. I didn't draw it very straight, but this is what's called the first ending. I continue with the song. I have a little G-sharp in there. Now, G-sharp is not listed in the uh, key signature, so therefore we call that an accidental. And it's only for one measure. Uh, if I needed to have another G-sharp in this measure, I'd have to write that sharp down again, because an accidental only goes for one measure. So this is the first First ending, and I continue with the song. There's a retard here. I slow down and I hit that hole. There's a little hole, and then that note is held. It can be held as long as I want to hold it. Since it is a quarter note, I probably don't want to hold it very long, but just enough to slow it down. Now we have a repeat sign. Where do you repeat to? You repeat to this repeat right here. What if I didn't write in that repeat? I don't know always do that. It doesn't matter. You would repeat there, and the reason you'd repeat there is that there's no other place where you can go. There's no, there's no other demarcation on this that would say you need to repeat somewhere else. So you start right over by that repeat, and you go through the song again. And when you get here, then uh, you don't play this, because this you played the first time. It's considered to be the first ending. You will go from here to the second ending, which is going to be, I don't know if I even put it down. It's going to be down here. I may have forgotten to write that in. I mean, I wrote it in, but I may have forgotten to, to uh, label it. So you skip that first ending and just go to the rest of the song and play the rest of it. You have a retard here. You have your dotted quarter note here. You have your hold. You can hold that for as long as you want. And then this double line signifies that the song is over. So even in a simple song, there's a lot you can learn from a simple song. And it doesn't matter that I didn't put the second ending in. It's obvious this is where it is. If you were writing, if you were uh, playing a piece of music, you would know that anyway. I usually write them in, though. Now, I could have written this differently. I could have written it, for example, in 6-8 time. 6-8 time is also can be used as waltz tempo. And if you have 6-8, let me point this out to you. Here is your sharp, your F sharp. The key remains, remains the same. It's the same song. When you listen to it, it's the same song. And you have six, eight time. What does that mean? There are six beats to the measure instead of three. 
And all the notes are equivalent to eighth notes. In other words, it's like you've doubled up everything. This is three, four. This is six, eight. It's still waltz tempo. The beats, though, are one eighth note long. Every eighth note is one beat. Now, does that work out? It works out fine. And a lot of people prefer to write in six, eight. Uh, I, do it, it, I do it the regular way because I think if you're a beginning student, it's a lot easier to catch on to. But six, eight time. You have six eighth notes. Here you had three quarter notes, or the equivalent of three quarter notes. But here we have six eighth notes, or the equivalent of eighth notes. Now, you start off with a couple of sixteenths. What are sixteenths? They're half of an eighth. So therefore, they're the same equivalent as the eighth notes would be in three four time or four four time. I hope this isn't getting too confusing. But you have a regular eighth note here. You split that in half, and you have six. So this is 1 and 2, 3, 4 and 5, 6. So you get your 6 beats to the measure. Uh, 1 and 2, 3, and this is 4, 5, 6. So you get the other 6 beats to the measure. 1 and 2, 3, 4 and 5, 6. 1 and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, in a way, it's easier writing uh, because you, you don't, it's not every time you turn around a measure has passed. But on the other hand, for a new student, it may be a little more difficult to figure out. But there's an awful lot of music that's written in 6-8 time. So this you need to be aware of. 1 and 2, 3, 4 and 5, 6. 1 and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I didn't write the whole song out like this, but that's the way it is. Because on 6, 8 time, the eighth beat, since the, since the eighth is the main, uh, the main note uh, beat pattern, these eighth notes are all one beat. And the sixteenths are all half of a beat. So one and two, three. There's two beats there. There's one and two, three, two beats there. When you get to the dotted quarter, you have three beats. Now, how does this work? Well, I'm going to um, push this over so you can see the other side. And we'll concentrate on the other side. I kind of just diagrammed this out so it would be easier for you to understand it. The, in 6-8 time, the eighth is one beat. And the sixteenth, Two sixteenths would be one beat because the sixteenth is half of the eighth. So one beat equals, a uh, one beat would equal the eighth note. One beat could also equal two sixteenths. Now, what about the dotted quarter? This is one, two, three. The dotted quarter is equal to three eighth notes. Two eighth notes is a, is a quarter note, and you add one half of it because a dot automatically acts, adds one half of the value of the note, and that's where you get your third beat. One, two, three. It's the same thing as if I was doing one, two, three, and adding it all together. These two might become one quarter note, and the eighth would be the same as the dot. So when you see a dotted quarter, and it's in six, eight time, that's automatically going to be three beats, one, two, three, but it's all together as one note. That's the way it's timed. Now, what about the theme of the song? I can simplify this song, which I'm going to do now. And I'm still looking at this particular page. But just to play it, um, I'm going to play it in the simplest form without adding all the extra notes. When I started out, I did this. And then I do it again because of the repeat side, and I end it with the second ending, which is And 
You have to end it, but even in the ending, it still carries on that theme, the rhythm of one and two and one and two, three, one and two, three, and that's the way it goes through the whole thing. So supposing I want to make this really simple for a beginning student, and I, if we can concentrate on this page, I have it written right here, and I, I've just labeled it theme of the song on this section right here. Maybe you can follow along. I'm not going to play it too fast. It's the same theme as, as the regular, except I've cut out the choppiness of the eighth notes, and this is what I get just for the theme of it. Yeah, thank you. the whole song. Now if I was teaching a student, I might start them off with the theme so they get thoroughly familiar with the theme, and then I add the other things. I would add eighth notes. change some things, but I always do that. And so what I might do if I was teaching a student, I would give them the simple song and I would add to it and I would add to it. So they would understand more in terms of the timing of it. Now what if I want to play it on another instrument? I have a few minutes left, so I think maybe I'll try something here. It may not work out completely, but well, uh, because I haven't really worked a whole lot with this, but as you know, I've said before, there's really a lot of similarity between the woodwind instruments. And here what I have is a little flutophone. So supposing I try to play at least part of it on this flutophone, the, the fingering is going to be similar, the timing is going to be similar, the sound is going to sound like a flutophone, but you can catch the theme of it. So let me try this. bad for a flutophone. What if I decide to try the song flute? Here's a little song flute. It's not even as advanced as a flutophone. Can I play it? Well, we'll try. I'm not sure every note. I'm going to have to refinger some of the notes as I go along, but that's all right. Basically, it's the same.
The value of the woodwinds is you can do so much with them. Well, we're about out of time. I was going to, well, let me try it on a, on a sweet tone. I'm just going to kind of squeeze this in. This is made in England. It's called a sweet tone. It is a, a, a conical, uh, conical kind of penny whistle, and I'm going to hope this goes well. tin whistles, they get very, very squealy, so I kind of expected to squeal and it did some, but that's characteristic of the instrument. You wouldn't normally be playing this with it. And I could do a penny whistle, I could do some other instruments, but I think we're run out of time, so I better close it here. Remember, if you're playing a simple song, get the most that you can out of it, enjoy it, dress it up a little so you can have a different kind of song. You can even play a duet with it and all of that. It really is interesting to do that. And any song that comes to your mind, you need to write it down, script it if you can, and then you won't lose it. Otherwise, you'll forget what it is. So we'll close it here. We'll be doing something else next time. Please join me then.